Hello, and welcome to Playwright, a podcast about creating and sharing new ways to play. My name is Ryan Hammond. You can call me H. And I'm Ryan Quintel. You can call me Q. Ryan, I know exactly what you want to talk about this week. IGN <laughs> has been in the news. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not going to talk about that this week. I do want to talk to you about something, though, because I dropped this in the Canon Rinse Slack, and mm-hmm. I want to, I, I might need your help or guidance. I went out and I got a raspberry pie. Um, and a okay. little case and a power supply and the whole thing. And I've got uh, Laka, L-A-K-K-A, I think that's our, uh, how you say mm. it, loaded up onto it. I really wanted to do this because I love the idea. I, I own a, um, uh, a Super NT, an analog Super NT, a bunch of Super Nintendo cartridges. But I would like something that is modern, tiny, and easy. I can just hook up to a backup TV Mm -hmm. and play those games on and also potentially some select other titles. However, I will back up a lot of the games that I have to play those other titles, but I am having the damnedest time figuring out how to get PlayStation games to load on the thing. And I just, there's no good, like this community is very established and known and kind of geeky and technical and there doesn't feel like there's a great guide or video series for someone like me mm, yeah to to just you know make something like this happen i have a raspberry pi with retroarch i've had success with like nes super nintendo and like genesis games but i think as soon as it starts getting into like playstation and n64 i at least on the model that i had I was starting to run into limitations with the, with like what the console, with what that little hardware was able to put out, you know? So you might be experiencing that. I don't know. It's interesting because this latest version of the Raspberry Pi has, get this, eight gigabytes of RAM. Wow. And I know, I I can't believe this tiny little uh, computer, but the, you know, the general consensus seems to be on all the forums, like weirdly up to the four the four gigabyte model of the three or the four could both run playstation games pretty okay the eight gig should be able to run them like a dream for some reason nobody's really cracked okay. nintendo 64 stuff oh. smoothly mm-hmm. which is strange to me but yeah it's weird you know i'm i'm i've got these <laughs> i've got these files i've got these game these uh um <clears throat> legal game backups let's say i have this thing and it's it's stuff loaded on it but it just seems like i'm doing something wrong or there's something sluggish about it because when i go to run some things like even like a certain you know subset of super nintendo games or something it seems like it's choppy and i'm like this thing has 50 super nintendo's worth of power in it there's no way i should have any any sort of problems well i can't say that i know either laka or the linux uh emulation scene well enough to be able to provide any useful advice but it could be a nice kind of toss out to the listeners if you have any experience with this type of thing and are able to kind of get in contact with q over social media then that would be helpful as well um <laughs> yeah drop something in the but, playwright uh, dms get go ahead and uh, i'm at ryan quintel on twitter send me something because i'm i need i i want to be able to play it's crazy you can't really play playstation one games a ton of them reliably on any modern anything it's wild yeah you just have to wait for like ports which is right <laughs> terribly inefficient way to experience that catalog of games right and it's funny right because it's i mean i think the the playstation vita situation showed sony that like people will give you money for this stuff but you have to make it available yeah i know the way it is at nintendo at least is that like everything that they release on virtual console has to be like extensively tested mm. and everything and so there is like a pretty significant cost of man hours and you know money that they're putting into it even to just kind of like put another rom on one of their services and i imagine that sony it's the exact same way and so i'm sure it's just a prioritization of man hours and where you know people are focused and uh you know with uh playstation top brass publicly saying that they don't find any value in old games it's uh, <laughs> kind of hard to to blame them for making the decisions that they've made yeah well i guess i'll just have to spend the rest of my hours with the mass effect legendary edition speaking of ports so. <laughs> 
Yeah, I've uh, you know, I'm I'm a bit of a sucker for remasters of games that I've previously liked, but I've held off of Mass Effect because I just don't see myself like reliving the adventure like i kind of had my yeah my adventure and that was my story <laughs> i don't right. know if i went back and did things like i would probably do them the, the same way although i don't know i i'm kind of with you although this time around i think um i think ashley's gonna go uh, <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> i didn't i didn't uh have her die the first time around and in retrospect, that was not the right decision. She's kind of a shitbag. Yeah, no, she should absolutely be the first one <laughs> off the ship. <laughs> uh, Gotta get along with yeah, my boy Garrus. I, I had a couple of couple of decisions in the Mass Effect series that had disastrous consequences and compounding disastrous consequences, but were the like morally correct choice for me to make. And so I wonder if now knowing the consequences, I would still make those decisions that led to those consequences or whether I would switch course there. A remaster like this yeah, is always tricky. dicey too, because I I worry, I don't know why I'm worried about it, but uh, it's stupid to worry about this, but I do worry that like for years, so many of us have been like Mass Effect, Mass Effect, Mass Effect, Mass Effect to have to have a new generation be able to be exposed to Mass Effect, but they're going to come to these games where they're going to be like, yo, this game's old as hell. Um, <laughs> you know, even with, even if it's running at 4K60, it's going to feel pretty old in many respects. And mm -hmm. I just, you know, it's like, a, can you go back home again sort of thing? Like, will a new generation even be able to appreciate it the way we appreciated it at the time? I don't know. I mean, people these days still play Planescape Torment, which is <laughs> crazy fair. archaic feeling. But, uh, you know, it's uh, like a good game is a good game. Good writing is good writing. Uh, I think it I think it's fine. I think going back to Knights of the Old Republic would be a bigger uh, jump for people than going back to Mass Effect, especially since they yeah. seem to have kind of modernized the gameplay of the first game making it less rpg and more in line with the others but yeah mass effect will still feel a little shooty shooty so i think people will uh mm -hmm. yeah will get on board i mean similarly the uh the near i don't want to say port the remaster uh that just came out um, oh yeah also kind of modernized its combat to feel more in line with its sequel so i kind of like this um i don't know if it's just like it sounds like it's a lot of work, which I'm sure it is. But like, if you have, you know, an entire game finished and ready to go, but one or two of the systems feel kind of old and archaic, like how much trouble is it <laughs> to go back in and just kind of like redo those aspects? Are you essentially kind of like rebuilding the whole game from scratch? And, you know, but you'd think you'd have to rebalance to the, a lot of the encounters at least. Uh, certainly. Yeah. But uh, I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm into this idea and uh, I'd, I'd love to see other games kind of get this like really slick modernization that we've seen, you know, a few high profile RPGs get this year. Yeah, I think that would be cool. I would love to see. I mean, Final Fantasy VII kind of touched every part of the, uh, <laughs> the, yeah. the thing. So it doesn't even, you know, that is a true like new yeah, game in the same way as well. That, uh, you know, Resident Evil 2 is and the story diverges like it's it's very explicitly not the same game right it, but uh, you know it's a it is an interesting thing of like could you go back like for example Mar mario 64 i think we were all expecting nintendo <laughs> I'll, I'll just shut up we're going like too long on this <laughs> i think i think we're all disappointed by what mario 64 <laughs> ended up being yeah that's and i was really about to open a whole can of worms and i was like you know what i can't do this again not this week <laughs> Q, why don't you lead us off with a video game pitch? Sure. So my pitch this week, we pitch a lot of detective shows. We have a long story history of playing detectives on Playwright. Um, and I want to do the opposite. So I want us to play in, in a Grand Theft Auto-like open world setting. I would like us to become a serial killer. Ooh, okay. <laughs> the, the, the general premise is that, you know, maybe you're playing... You know, somebody who's on the brink, somebody who's uh, who's about to make a really terrible decision, but you yourself in the world get to choose your first victim. And then it's up to you 
to be consistent in some way, whether that's in the style of murder or the type of person you're murdering um, or uh, or some pattern of geography or something like that. But you yourself become the serial killer. So you kind of are setting up those initial rules and conditions and then you have to be consistent with them. And then I think we could layer in all sorts of mechanics uh, from there, try and evoke the true murder mystery serial killer movie vibes. All right. Start on the clock. So, so yeah, this is tricky. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't like innocent people to be murdered. <laughs> I think in general, I think, you know, there are some games that really kind of run that line of, you know, it's kind of like rubbing me the wrong way. Like uh, on one hand, like there are games, like I've talked about party hard on here before where you're essentially like a killer at like a big house party and it's your job to like kill the party goers one by one and then hide them before, you know, panic sets in and people start noticing or people catch you in the act and stuff like that. And so it's kind of like a hitman game where everyone is the target. Right. And that makes me really uncomfortable because that feels like the kind of indiscriminate murder that like people actually do that turn into like massive, horrible tragedies. Uh, but then again, like I play games like Grand Theft Auto and I can run people over and just kind of like, you know, as long as you don't do it intentionally, sometimes you just like swerve off the road and hit somebody and they go ragdolling all around. And it like, this is kind of like comedy to that, uh, you know, Hitman. I've killed people to avoid being <laughs> detected a number of times, you know, even people who do those kind of like kill everyone on the map in Hitman types of um, challenges. Like I don't really have like a strong moral aversion to that because everyone in those games kind of feels more like board game pieces anyways but uh, yeah for some reason like anything that's like trying to trying to depict people as normal people just kind of going about their business entirely innocently and tasking you with like getting points for killing as many of them as you can like it i don't know maybe it's just as an american that hits pretty close to home <laughs> yeah well one of the things, I mean, maybe we can do something to kind of shift the tone of it. But, I, you know, there's always, too, there, that sort of fiction cliche of, like, uh, the killer who's going to be the only one who punishes the mm -hmm. bad people or something like mm -hmm. that. So perhaps we can provide some kind of narrative wrapper of, like, going around and and doing these things, both in a way that maybe is more absurdist, but also... And I feel like Hitman actually kind of takes this tact, right? Because like no, no one person really deserves to like, nobody should be allowed to kill anybody. But, um, but you know, Hitman's whole job is to kill people, um, even when they do bad, mm -hmm. bad things. Um, so I wonder if there's like an absurdist angle or like, this is a serial killer who's going around and finding people who are, you know, hurting someone else or doing something awful or something like that. I think if you take a hitman angle and choose kind of like highly specific targets or take like a punisher angle where you're like, you know, busting criminal organizations and white supremacist groups and shit like that, then like that, that could be interesting if the focus of the game is less on the killing and more about like cleaning up the crime scene afterwards to make your crime untraceable. Like that, that could be interesting playing those cleaners and John wick, you know, who have to come in and make it look like nothing happened there, which I, there is a game called serial cleaner that does kind of get into that. But I think one particular example that I would like to call out is the first scene of Fahrenheit, which was uh, released as Indigo Prophecy in America. Have you played this one? Indigo Prophecy? No. This was not David Cage's first game, but it was his first, oh. like, very prominent game, uh, which, you know, the, the number of nice things that I've said about David Cage's games over the years <laughs> of Playwright can probably be counted on one hand. But I will say that, like, probably the high point of his career was the opening scene of Indigo Prophecy where you play a character who is like, I guess is like remotely possessed and controlled in like a voodoo type of situation to murder somebody else in a public restroom. And basically your character just kind of like awakens from 
this haze with a murder having having taken place at his own hands. And he's in a public place. He doesn't know when somebody's about to come in. I think the I think he hears like police or he hears a policeman like off duty or kind of wrapping up his shift, like having dinner in this diner that he's in. And he has to cover up this murder. And it's interesting because like he doesn't know how the murder occurred, like where weapons might be hidden or what surfaces might have fingerprints or blood stains or everything. And so, you know, you have to kind of without context, go around and clean off all of the surfaces. And, you know, if you, if you miss one or two, which is very easy to do, like the story does remember that and kind of adapt around that, you know, he's the main character of the game. Mm. He's not like busted that early in the game, but I think that there are some level of like, if not narrative consequences, then at least like narrative remembrance of uh, how well you did in that opening scene. It's a very interesting scene in a game that goes pretty steadily downhill from there. <laughs> um, he, uh, shocking. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, one of, one of the reasons why this idea came to mind is, I th- and I think I talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I, I watched, um, and get, you know, go ahead and everybody can give me crap, but I watched Zodiac for the first time. Mm, yeah. There's so many movies and I, and I, I watched the little things recently and uh, my wife and I are in the middle of watching. We, uh, there's a, a good murder mystery is always going to go over well in the uh, Quintel household. So the, the, the general vibe of, you know, the sort of person who, has such beliefs about themselves and what they're doing and the hubris and that, that turn you see in many, many sort of crime dramas of, you know, the killer kind of wants to be caught. I was thinking that, you know, almost imagine a hitman level. And maybe this is, maybe there's a hitman um, expansion or something, but a hitman level mm-hmm. where you have to like offer up a certain number of clues to people who are trying to catch you like <laughs> you, the, the idea of the killer that wants to be caught or the killer that is, that is ever making the game more difficult for themselves by exposing themselves in different ways and uh, putting themselves at, at risk just because they, that is their, you know, their sick way of, of getting additional thrill and pleasure out of what they're doing. I was wondering if there is a mechanic of like, you know, kind of telegraphing your next move or revealing something to someone who is trying to stop you from doing that. Like, Oh, I'll be in this neighbor, you know, everything from like location to, you know, mo uh, method or something like that. Perhaps even a more palatable way to, to frame this would be like being the Riddler in Batman. Yeah. <laughs> or he's not out there performing kind of gruesome murders on average citizens, but like anytime he goes and robs a bank or sticks up a chemical plant or whatever, like yeah, yeah, yeah. he's uh he's I don't know what it is, like a it must be a sexual thing, right? Uh but he's always like leaving these clues. He's I believe getting it's some sort of a thriller, then it definitely is a sexual thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, being compelled to kind of leave these clues. And I think there's, I think it's challenging to s- like systemically represent that in a game where you're essentially kind of trying to square off against like AI opponents without it being too prescriptive. But I, like, I, I see the thrill in that. I just don't know how to translate that into mechanics. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, I wonder if it's, I wonder, if, I mean, because really that the exposing pieces of your plan or whatever are really about making it's about difficulty. And it's also about, it's only fun for you if it's ever increasingly taking things off the table. And so I, I almost think of it as like playing a Forza, for example, and saying, okay, well, you know, this next race, I'm going to turn the anti-lock brakes off. And in this next race, the, I'm going to take all the assisted steering or I'm going to dial that down a bit. And, but potentially a game where, yeah, maybe it's a heist or a crime that we're trying to get. Hey, I'll never say no to a Batman game. So 
uh <laughs> if i'm the riddler like could the riddler game format be constantly pushing you to say what tricks does the riddler have that you're going to be taking away from yourself in this mission or it could be the more clues that you leave behind the more powerful you become like oh yeah you can expect the police to always arrive like 2 minutes into a crime uh, if you think of this as like a payday, the heist type of situation and, uh, but Batman can arrive at any point. And if, if he shows up, then it's going to be trouble essentially. And so you want to get out before Batman gets there. But if you leave enough clues that point to your next destination, you become like infused with some sort of power that allows you to like basically make the police like nothing, you know? And so you are giving yourself a shorter timer on the Batman countdown, but the police become less and less of a problem. You know, you can mow them down, you can take their bullets, you know, whatever it is, he becomes, you know, powered up. <laughs> it's it's so funny in this modern Resident Evil context, but <laughs> I know this is kind of an all over the place pitch, but the the idea of Batman as a Mr. X inside of a like Gotham crime <laughs> game is is pretty cool. I like that. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and stop the clock there and let's give it a name. I mean, Riddler's whole thing is riddle me this, right? Like, I, I wonder yeah, if that's it's kind of where like, I was going as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does seem like the right answer. All right. Riddle me this first truly current gen Batman experience. Oh, yeah. All right. My pitch for the day, a series of mini games that teach you how to record electronic and chiptune music. And utilize sine waves, square waves, uh, sawtooth waves, triangle waves, and all others to, I don't know, avoid obstacles and stuff. I haven't really figured out what the core gameplay mechanic is, but I, I know that I like I like watching multi-channel chiptune music and watching the different waves because they have you know websites and oftentimes you'll see these types of things on YouTube where each wave will be kind of singled out and you can see like the weird shapes they make and it kind of makes you think like. I could, I could learn how this works. And so I'd love to, to have some sort of a game that does like, you know, through the course of its game kind of inadvertently teach people how to, uh, how to read and record chip tune type music. Mm. Start the clock. I, I, one of the things I, I, my mind went is there's some really cool synthesizers. I actually, I think one of them that comes to mind, I think it's called the Korg, op six o p s i x and mm -hmm. i'm googling it just to make sure i have the visual correct yeah the, the korg op six is one of them but the, the kind of latest or not even latest but like in some synthesizers you will get a a screen that essentially gives you a readout of what the current waveform that you're playing mm -hmm. right now and korg kind of has this really very kind of attractive oled looking wave uh display on its uh on its machines and it it actually makes me think how fun would it be to i don't know kind of like platform around these waves they look like kind of mario hills stuff when you get into some of the the uh more well you'll be waves. pleasantly surprised that there is a game that uh is it all about uh, this? You may have seen it. Um, Vib Ribbon back on the PlayStation 1 is a game where you're not necessarily platforming, but you are essentially kind of walking along what looks like a waveform line. It's not like it's... Oh, yeah. It, it's more kind of a procedural... I remember this ...obstacle thing. course in a way, but like it definitely plays with the, with the kind of look and feel of waveforms without actually... Uh, kind of bending to that convention convention entirely. Uh, so my next place that my brain went is what if it was more like a, I don't know if uh, uh, more physics-y, like if there was a ball or something that you're kind of controlling as you, because, hmm. you know, a synthesizer is mostly like analog dials and stuff. You don't even necessarily have to have, you know, piano keys to, to play with one. So you could do this entirely digital interface where you're like toggling between these things, messing with waves. Maybe you could start to do wave separation to kind of cause jitter and, and pick up speed, but then suddenly turn it into a sawtooth wave um, so that you could either maybe totally stop momentum or you can try and create uh, some downward force to 
to destroy an enemy or something like that. I, you know, I, it's kind of a little bit all over the place, but, um, that's where my mind it is. It would be interesting it. if you have this ball that's kind of rolling along left to right throughout the song. Maybe there's kind of like a backing beat that goes along with it as well. And you're tasked with playing the lead part. And you can see kind of like a ghosted trail of where the ball is going to be. And it's your job to make sure that the ball is always where it needs to be, you know, along with its kind of ghosted trail. Oh. I guess if you think about like, uh, Citus, Citus, is that what it's called? C-Y-T-U-S? I'm going to have to look this up. Citus, yeah, that, I mean, that sounds right. Okay, yeah, I think I got the name right there. Uh, Citus is a game on, uh, on mobile and on Switch as well. Uh, you can think of it kind of like the Uendan games as well, like Elite Beat Agents, where there's kind of a, a line that scrolls up and down the screen and several... S- you know, circles that open up and you have to tap them when the line crosses over that circle. And so the notes appear ahead of when you need to interact with them. But anyways, I'm kind of getting off track there. But like, so essentially you're trying to keep the ball where it needs to be at every point during the music. And then the way to, like, if you play it perfectly, if you're employing all the correct, you know, the sine wave for a nice kind of gentle slope or a gentle slowdown, a, you know, a square wave to really stop the ball in its track for a little while, uh, like a wall, um, the sawtooth and the triangles to have, you know, different, different intensities of like a, a path, a hill it could descend. And so if you play it perfectly, then you would be playing a really cool lead track for, this um this piece of music you know it kind of like guitar hero feel but it would be an entirely different interface than you've ever used before yeah and i think like if you had dials a sine wave could almost end up feeling like a bit of like an ollie ollie or something but you're you're turning it into a half pipe to build up momentum and then you know Mm -hmm. the sawtooth wave can give you a you know, maybe kind of a directional spring or, or or triangle wave or something like that but i love the idea of um I don't know, being able to like tone, I know the wave doesn't exactly work this way, but kind of like, I don't know if it's a rotation, but alter the tone in such a way that say a square wave could become a staircase like, um, platforming thing. And then, you know, you, you're creating some bounce that way. If you started at the top of the staircase and kind of boom, 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 boom down. But I I do like the idea of you're just kind of always playing with the momentum of this object. And like you said, like you're almost, I don't know if it's like under the gun or whatever, but you're, you're trying to, like you said, get this, this thing into the position where it needs to be in the shortest amount of time. It could almost feel like desert golfing where it's just kind of this endless little, Hey, you're always just yeah, timed exactly. and you get your closest time or whatever. Yeah. And um, it would be great if you could also kind of incorporate intensity and velocity of hitting the notes as well so you know you could plug in a keyboard that has in like a musical keyboard that has intensity and velocity uh you know tracking capabilities maybe if you're playing with a controller then you can like hit a button to trigger one of the types of waves but it's not until you press down on the trigger buttons which are analog that the note would actually play so you have to kind of like set the mode and then hit the note separately so you do get that kind of velocity control um so you can make something that really kind of springs up out of nowhere and is very intense or you can do something that feels like a very kind of slow build yeah and one of the things i think is cool is that like what you can layer on top of it is either a distinct mode or just allow someone to kind of play with sound and then make the ball potentially be like an additional digital rhythm synthesizer on top of like the wave that you're already building and have that be synthesized in some way. So you're, you are generating kind of an experimental series of like tones and beats and maybe at any point you can just kind of smack a button and and lock in you know a four bar recording so that you can loop it over and over so um we have this kind of left to right scrolling screen that kind of takes you through each of these songs and gets you to play uh lead parts you know maybe there is 
maybe there's secret ways to unlock like uh or maybe you know as the difficulty increases we can kind of get you know instead of becoming more prescriptive like a guitar hero we could find interesting ways to make it a little bit more free form and encourage improvisation in interesting ways not sure what that would be just yet but i'm sure that there are ways that it could be done uh, but it would also be interesting if like if throughout the game we can kind of play with the structure of the course as well i'm, I'm really inspired by a recent rhythm game i think it's i think it's is still an early access called rhythm doctor um that i've talked about on mm. playwright before but it's like kind of a warrior wear style rhythm game not entirely it's not micro games like you are playing through an entire song at a time but it does a lot of like trolley types of behaviors to make it more difficult than you would expect it to be and basically your task is like every song is a uh, kind of an eight count measure and you have to hit the space bar and like count seven or something like that and but like the the s- screen goes weird sometimes the audio cuts out for a few counts sometimes yeah the window will like randomly resize and go to other screens and it's like there's a bunch of like weird things that it does to try to keep it like unpredictable and interesting and uh, the music gets more kind of like experimental and complex as well it's it's pretty cool but yeah i, I think it would be interesting if like as you're doing this kind of platformery course, like maybe sometimes it wraps around itself like a circle and then you have to play kind of like a Mario Galaxy style, like hopping between oh. every surface of the circle. Uh, maybe sometimes it turns into like a three dimensional course and you have to use what you learn to control things in a different perspective. Um, I would just, you know, I would like there to be ways for this to kind of evolve throughout the play experience. Yeah, it would be nice to dial in some like res aesthetic in there as well. You know, get that, uh, just get as close to that um, cool wire framey like like you said that uh, that old PlayStation game. What was it called? The Vib, Rib- Vib ribbon. ribbon. Yeah, what would that look like uh, if you really blew out the concept? And you know, I, I think you could go even further. It's a shame. Where, where I actually thought about for input, it's a shame that we don't have the. You mentioned Elite Beat Agents. It's a shame we don't have the 3DS anymore because I mean, the we style. Do. <laughs> well, yeah, I know, but I mean, Nintendo is not like actively in love with the 3DS right now because mm. the stylus is such a perfect way of drawing these exact waves and actually being able to organically just like shape a wave on screen by drawing it. And so I wonder if there's a not an angle where you almost have like a Kirby epic yarn sort of thing but kirby's doing some audio surfing as you draw these different ways yeah, exactly. and experiment with the sounds I mean, it's kind of like line writer at that point uh but anyways that's enough time on that one let's go ahead and close it down and uh let's give it a name <laughs> so is sign writer too close sign sign writer is pretty good s-i-n-e right yeah <laughs> i was actually just toggling between all the different like is there s- s- saw sign or s- <laughs> square sign, sign square. Yeah, I think I think sign rider is is cooler. Nice pun on that older game. All right, let's uh, let's hop on over to our community and see what y'all have for us today. We've been uh, very happy to see a number of emails come in, and uh, I think we I think we might just have enough to uh, get at least to the end of the show, which is uh, which is nice, wow. but. Don't uh, don't stop them from coming in. If we have more than we can take by the time that the show ends, then we'll just do like a ton of them in the last episode. <laughs> so we will get through everything. Don't be discouraged if you feel like you're jumping straight to the back of the queue because you are not. <laughs> All right. This one comes from Connor Campbell, who says, my original pitch that I had when I first started listening to you was a Persona style Fire Emblem game. And then I realized Fire Emblem Three Houses did that. I guess just to interject. <laughs> yeah. um, also, what is that game? Uh, Tokyo Mirage Session Sharp FE is a oh, Persona man. style game with Fire Emblem characters in it. So, oh my god, not exactly the same thing, but you know, nice uh, combination of of those elements. So I was thinking about something that uh, something fun that could be created 
by introducing personas, day cycle, social links, and dungeon crawling. What I finally realized was that this could uh, was that it would be fun to introduce classical mythology into the mix. You could either do demigods that are born from the gods of Greek, Roman, Norse, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, etc. mythologies, who all go to school together, or possibly a school council setting where gods of different mythos have to interact with each other. Uh, maybe even where they are going in dungeons to have to face off with Cthulhu monsters or some other enemies. Would there be a character creator where you could get to choose which god was your parent? Would that change which characters are your friends, join your party, uh, join your party or uh, make your social links harder or easier to advance? Hope that all makes sense. Anyways, love the show and may the pitch get the creative juices flowing. Oh, Thank that's you very nice. much, Connor. Let's start the clock. Well, my my mind drifted to Hades. Yeah, quite absolutely. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was, and I honestly think that in in actually in some ways Hades is kind of kind of doing this, but but without actually trying to do much of a sim in terms of uh, the out of combat stuff. Although it, yeah, does, it does have feel... a social league system of uh, kind of getting to know the gods better and gaining favor with them, and sometimes gaining yeah. favor with one. Uh, kind of crosses paths with another and makes them a little bit cross with you. So I, I, yeah, I see the parallels here. And and I just think that that game benefited from having a ton of characters who it would, it'd be very fun to do a prequel game where like a lot of these characters are in high school together. Yeah, absolutely. I think Hades being restricted to just Greek mythology is fine as a starting point but like i do love this concept of kind of like a big crossover you know god of war is kind of toying around with that yeah but it's really just kratos that is crossing over between the two and he's not really like an original member of the greek pantheon or anything like that like but i'd love to see these different gods from all these different mythologies interact and you know, go to school together or, or whatever it is. Bully each other because there's overlap in what their areas of responsibility Yeah, that's an interesting. <laughs> like, who is the god of thunder? Is it Thor? Is it Zeus? You know, all these all these people who seem to have to kind of lay claim and dominion to these same things. And then you zoom out and everyone's like, I don't know why those two are just always making such a ruckus. They're both complaining. Oh, I'm the god of thunder. I'm the god of thunder. Settle it, boys. That That is one thing that I kind of don't like about stories about gods is that they all have to be like the god of something. And, you know, if this just was like X-Men where people just had different powers, but weren't like, I am the eye beams guy and nobody else will have eye beams because I have them. Like, yeah, you're right. You, you know. actually, that's incredible that you pointed that out. Cause it hadn't occurred to me just now, but like, <laughs> surely if this is how mutations work, we'd get like a, a little overlap. There's only so much human genome yeah. to go around. <laughs> Why isn't there like a dozen Cyclops psi hanging out? Wow. That's interesting. What if, what if, okay. You, there's something to this game where you can kind of play as a god in competition for, you know, I mean, a person with a power, essentially an X-Men, right? To With the same mm-hmm. power set as these other gods and everybody's kind of muscling to be the most, you know, voted the most popular god in school in a way. Where, where I, I keep going back to this uh, in my mind, this Eddie Izzard bit where he talks about Jeff, the god of biscuits, uh, <laughs> and uh, how Jeff I, doesn't get any respect because he's the god of biscuits and they just had a bunch of gods hanging out. But uh, I do like the idea of you being able to make like, I'm Cindy and I want to I want to be the god of thunder. And so Cindy is going to go and run in the school's annual triathlon thing so that she can compete and actually win favor as the the official god of thunder but you can kind of pick which god you're gonna challenge and you develop a little bit of a school rivalry uh, that becomes your pokemon-esque rival if you will maybe the way that this works is that like powers are passed down from god to god they're not like natural occurrences and so there can be overlap and you know there will be but it's like the upperclassmen have, you know, the powers because they've gotten them from the classes above them. And maybe you play kind of a, a member of like one of the younger classes in the school and 
you have to like you have to either kind of convince one of them that they're that you're worthy of passing on their power to you not that they would lose it but it's kind of like bestowing somebody a a gift in a way or maybe it's like passed on through like romance and so you have this kind of like young adult fiction uh setting which is i mean it feels kind of perfect for for a YA novel where <laughs> like you are essentially like a blank slate that is competing for the affection of upperclassmen to, you know, overcome your inherent dorkiness of being a, a lower classman, but but you know, trying to, to be bestowed with impress their powers. whoever and yeah, just to get somebody's power so that you can, you know, find your own way in the world and that's just the way that it's always been. And I don't, I don't know, interesting. Yeah, it's funny that this stuff is like patented, but I, I almost my mind goes to like, hey, here's a perfect use for the nemesis system, right? It's so stupid that we that Warner Brothers yeah. like owns that thing. But I love the idea of you get to kind of replay this multiple times, install new people as upperclassmen who have all of their own personality traits and then you know, you can play through again and then the social dynamics change because you've kind of put somebody in a position of power that, uh, you know, just behaves differently. So we have this, um, so we have the different gods from the different mythologies. Yeah. I mean, this is also kind of a great educational tool tool. There are the ones that everyone's familiar with, but then there's, you know, huge rich mythologies that I feel, you know, personally, like I've missed out. Like I know, very little about the pantheons of Hindu or Shinto or any of these other yeah. you know, religions. There's, I'm sure there's like all sorts of African religions that I just know very little about. And, you know, I, I would love to be exposed to different gods than just the same ones that I keep seeing in all sorts of games already. Yeah, me too. And I, and I, I think too, that you would get, you could really like, if you built out whole parts of the school and stuff where different gods like to hang out, you could really start to have, you know, their powers are a reflection of the environment and you could, you know, have uh, the uh, Poseidon or something like, okay, there's a whole section to, you have to go swim laps with Poseidon because down in the gym, it's all filled with water now because, uh, you know, here we go again. But I, I do like the idea of the environment dramatic and changeable and stuff even if it's like starts as a very boring looking high school you know in the same way that you're, you're buffy the vampire slayers or whatever a lot of drama happens basically on the same set over and over and over again but it's lit differently it's changed over time i think you could do a cool high school drama where these gods are permanently in some ways changing you know a big fight breaks out a food fight breaks out or whatever and oh no somebody uh you know knocked down three walls of the cafeteria so we're gonna have some open air classrooms surrounding it or something you know this could very easily as it is right now translate into a visual novel and i think it would be pretty successful for what it is the thing that i like about you know hades and persona and other games like that is that you know they build kind of an interesting and fun gameplay experience on top of the already engaging story and character interactions like there's something for you to actually kind of yeah. work towards and do as well which you know again not to imply that visual novels don't have anything going on for them it's just you know it's just different like i i would love to find some sort of a hook to create like a kind of a gameplay core to build this all around as well well uh, one of the things that comes to mind is actually um, two games that didn't do too well, but multiple games have done things like this in the past, where the two games I was referencing, number one, Anthem, which I think had this cool idea of like, hey, if one person is a fire or lightning person, another person is an ice person, that, you know, together you get one, two, punch, you know, your sort of rock, paper, scissors, elemental, Pokemon style stuff going on. But then it also made me think of actually the latest Marvel Ultimate Alliance that kind of unceremoniously came and went for Switch, where mm -hmm. certain characters, if they're from the same 
uh, fictional, you know, sort of related to each other. Like if Wolverine and Spider-Man, because they've crossed over multiple times in comics, are hanging out, um, there was some synergy. Or if you had all of the Fantastic Four together, you know, you get the Fantastic Four bonus and that, you know, equals X, Y, or Z. So I like the idea of combat-wise, not only having these different gods having different abilities, different buffs, debuffs, that sort of thing, but to have synergies like hey you know i think if you know this god who's angry all the time and this god of love uh get together that maybe they'll they'll kind of balance each other out you know like <laughs> the the angry god will chill out a little bit and we'll get some synergy going on in our combat party so i do like spending the the high school time competing with each other building these relationships getting to know the personalities of the gods but then as you assemble the party to go out you're kind of, maybe it's a combination of looking at, hey, what the dungeon's going to be, plus, you know, I want to build the relationship of these two people a little bit like in Fire Emblem, so to make sure that there's synergy, I'm going to make sure they're together in the party as they venture out. All right, let's uh, let's close it down, let's give it a name. The word deity is coming to mind. I'm trying to think of like words for schools, would this be your almighty mater? Yeah, that's that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Almighty Mater is it, it's not bad. It's are all these gods prayed to or worshipped? I suppose so. I think I need to think of more alternate names for school. I so want to. I, I so want to put the word like high in it or something. <laughs> it, it almost like it, maybe there's something with the universe or university. Yeah, I was kind of thinking of that earlier but i don't want it to sound like a space game right (laughs) college high school oh i wonder if there's like a school of rock thing to do like school school of gods is too is obvious but like school of this is tough this is a tough what the hell what are the other people persona that's just totally abstracted fire emblem universe deity doesn't quite work either (laughs) <laughs> universe deity it's fun to say though it is fun to say <laughs> I, I i my brain is also going after the word wrath in some way but i don't know if that's there's like riff wrath wrath or something you no know, god of chore but it's not that doesn't really evoke education i wonder if there's anything of like with detention or principles or you go Almighty Academy. Oh, hey, that's the that's the first one that really sounds like a thing. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. We can roll with that. That one's a bit tricky. Because the school mascot could be for. the Almighty's, like that's the school team name. <laughs> that's kind of funny. The Almighty's might be a good name too. Anyways, thank you, Connor Campbell, for sending that one in to our website. You can uh, continue to send us new video game pitches, even though the number of shows are low. But uh, again, we will get to everything that we are sent. Um, if you want to send it into playwrightcast.com slash pitch, you can tweet us at playwrightcast or email us playwrightcast at gmail.com. Special thank you to Proto Dome for the use of our theme song, Hello World, off the album Blue Noise. And when you're listening to things, go spend some time with the Sausage Factory and the Cannon Rinse podcast. And to take us out of the show today, why don't you give us a redacted game? Okay, here we go. Let's see if I can stump you. In I, every time I go to read these things, I want to do it as like a like a VO artist or something. In mm-hmm. Redacted, you are a Redacted of the last city on Redacted. You are able to wield incredible power, explore the ancient ruins of Redacted, Redacted, from the vast dunes of Redacted to the lush jungles of Redacted. Defeat redacted enemies. Reclaim all that we have lost. Become legend. There's a lot more. I can keep going. (laughs) I'll give you a little bit more. Embark on an epic action adventure with rich cinematic storytelling where you unravel the mysteries of Redacted Redacted and reclaim what we lost at the fall of Redacted Redacted. The next evolution of a redacted action genre that promises to provide an unprecedented combination of storytelling, cooperative, competitive, and redacted gameplay, and personal redacted that are all woven into an expansive redacted redacted world.
rich in right. words. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there. So I get the feeling this is kind of like a spacefaring type of game. It sounds like, because you said that it was the last city on Redacted as opposed to like in Redacted, which makes me think of like ah. on a planet rather than in a country. Yeah. You don't really say the which last got me thinking city about, on America. Yeah. Which got me thinking about like Outer Wilds and mm. uh, Heaven's Vault. But then you talked about defeating enemies, which neither of those games do. There is no combat. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm just trying to think through, like, what kind of space exploration games, you know, there's No Man's Sky, which you don't start off as, like, a remnant of, like, the last city of anywhere, really. Uh, you are just kind of... Yeah, you're kind of dropped thrown in. into the universe. Yeah. You're generated, if you will. <laughs> so this could be a... Mm -hmm. Is this a... Ah, shoot. Mm. There's no multiplayer. Mm. I was thinking about Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank, but this talks about kind of cooperative play, which like those both have duos in their lead roles, but it's not something it's interesting. that players yeah, the can list play is together cooperatively. Cooperative, competitive, and redacted gameplay. So there is a mm -hmm. third. All right. I'm trying to think through a multiplayer. Okay. How about, how about, how about Destiny? You ding dang dog. Congratulations. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> in one. He got it in one. Oh wow. <laughs> I was I was ready to uh because I think the the funny thing about this destiny listing is I think the metadata adds confusion. Oh, okay. <laughs> and and here here's some of the metadata. It's the number two most discussed game of its platform. Uh, of 2014 mm -hmm. number three most shared game of its platform but number 57 best <laughs> i mean that's fair like the first destiny wasn't like a great <laughs> game but yeah. it was popular so right right it was wildly yeah, popular tracks. but it wasn't great it was uh metascore 76 and uh, i guess the users have cooled over time 6.1 for user score okay so no. i was like man if i I should I shouldn't have given you so much description. It was too much. Once they start talking about the modes, I think I oversold it. I don't know. I think that's that's what makes it interesting, though. But I, I don't know. You could choose to hold back however much you want to. But uh, yeah, no, I, I feel good about that. <laughs> All the redactions are very explicitly in Destiny. You are a guardian, the last city of yeah. Earth. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god. Yeah, and by the way, the description continues on with another whole paragraph of you're using armor and weapons and visual customizations. So I'm like, well, again, this is basically explaining the oh, whole yeah. game. But yeah, good job. Good job. All right, that's my standard now. <laughs> I got to try and get it in one one of these times. I've never done that before. Uh, I've, I've always wanted to like, so I think about how quickly I forget things. I think it would be such a, like a baller move to tell you what the redacted game is at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> see if you can remember at the end <laughs> i it's so funny that you said that because literally as you were kind of going through game titles i was like i should mm -hmm. just say you know it could be a destiny just it's it just it, i just dangled the suggestion kind of take there. all the satisfaction out of getting it though <laughs> <laughs> it would but i mean i just man it, we it's we're we're starting to get into a little bit of a sinister mindset with this. So you know, I, things I kinda... that are like destiny and it's like, okay, yeah. So I'm thinking <laughs> about like, uh, that Tenno game. What is it? The Wait, Anno you said? No, Tenno, the Tenno con is built around a particular game. Oh yeah. Yeah. Game, Warframe. Right? Warframe. That's it. This could, yeah, this could be a, a Warframe for sure. This description would seemingly apply. Yeah. I think there's a lot of games these days that have taken after destiny. Anyways, well, good thanks job. for listening, everyone. We'll catch you again last or next week. Last week. We will catch you again last week. You can choose to listen to them out of order and we will be there waiting for you. But we will also <laughs> catch you again next week. Bye.